As we head into the home stretch of this month of World War I games, um, I figured that we would play Battle for Galicia 1914 again. Um, since I enjoyed it so much the first time, you know, I figured why not just do a bunch more videos on it. Obviously that's a joke. And this is not a re-upload of the same video, which I have been known to do by accident sometimes. Um, so why do I have Galicia 1914 pulled out? Well, the reason for that is because we're actually playing another Paper Wars game from Compass called Burning Mountains 1916, the Austro-Hungarian Spring Offensive against Italy. Now, we've done some East Front this month. We've done a little bit of West Front, though that did not go as, as great as I had hoped. Um, so now we're going to do a little bit of the Alpine Italian Front, which is, to me, the most fascinating part of World War I um, from a... Um, perspective of it doesn't get talked about a lot it was a fairly static front and and it featured two powers who didn't figure so heavily into sort of the the omnipresent world war one narrative that we all think about when we think about france and germany and, and the russians and and all of that um so this is burning mountains 1916 uh from issue 89 which was the spring 2018 issue of paper wars from compass um so this is what the game looks like at setup here um, and there is actually a reason that I pulled out, uh, Paper Wars, uh, no, issue 97, uh, because of the lineage between these two games. So as a brief explainer, um, I will say that, uh, Burning Mountains 1916 caught my eye after I had already picked up Galicia 1914. I'm really, the Italian front, like I said, is super interesting to me. Um, and then I found out that, uh, Burning Mountains is using the exact same system as Galicia 1914. In fact, uh, the Battle for Galicia came out, uh, like I said, in the mid-2000s from Mike uh, Resch, um, and then was reprinted in Paper Wars. Well, after that game came out, uh, the designer uh, of, of uh, uh, Burning Mountains 1916 really liked the system that Mike Resch had created. So he wanted to do his own game using that system, and Mike Resch said, hey, go ahead. So he created a, pr I believe it was print and play uh version that then later came out in an Italian magazine. And this has a title, this game has a title in Italian that I can, uh, can't remember off the top of my head and probably couldn't pronounce anyways. Um, but again, Compass picked it up and decided that they were going to print it in Paper Wars. And so what we have here is a descendant of the Battle for Galicia in 1914 uh, redone in the style um, that Galicia then was redone in, in Paper Wars magazine. So a little bit more spruced up, a little bit more professional production. And uh, you can see here the map and the counters um, at setup. Obviously, the Italians in green, the Austro-Hungarians in gray. Um, and this was the spring offensive uh, in 1916 uh, that was the Austro-Hungarian attempt to kind of cut through the Alps and surround the Isonzo, or cut off, I should say, the Isonzo front um, and knock the Italians out of the war. So it was a fairly important battle um, for uh, that f part of World War I. And certainly, um, I believe the Italians managed to hold out and defend, um, but it was a close thing. And, um, you know, the Austro-Hungarians... Uh, ended up uh, struggling against the Italians for a lot longer uh, over the course of the next uh, year or two. Um, so that's the game. We'll come back to that. But there's something else that I would like to um, uh, show you, and that is uh, the reason I pulled out these games again. As you know, I did a, a haul video recently with Gorizia 1916, and I talked a little bit about Straf Expedition as well. Um, these are uh, both games from Europa Simula Zoni that actually are by the same designer as Burning, uh, Burning Mountains 1916. Completely different system um, and a completely different scale, which is why I wanted to highlight this. But what's interesting is that um, this game, Straf Expedition, which I didn't pull out in the hall, um, is actually on the exact same topic as Burning Mountains 1916. Uh, the only difference is the scale of the game. This is, uh, so Burning Mountains is a brigade level game uh, and covering this this part of the uh, of Italy. And Straf Expedition is a um, regimental scale game. So uh, uh, the more zoomed in, uh, this is about uh, half the size from a map perspective of this game, but they are all done by the same designer, Andrea Brusati. Um, and so I just found that interesting, and in that there's sort of this DNA of my World War One play month has all sort of come full circle here, um, and and as we get ready to start this game. But before we do that, I wanted to show you sort of the difference in scale um, between Straf Expedition and Burning Mountain, since they are ex on the exact same topic. So give me one moment. So here I've got side by side uh, the eastern map from Straf Expedition and the entire map from Burning Mountains. And you can see that at the regimental scale this and scale of the game, Straf Expedition is huge. Um, and essentially what you're looking at here is that um, the right half of this map is this entire map plus some. There's actually 
it, this actually goes further south than this map does, but I'll show you uh, here in the middle, we've got uh, Arciero. Um, Arciero, I believe is how you pronounce it. And Arciero on this map is here. So you can see we've got some of the same basic terrain features, the river, the road, up in these mountains, but you can see this map actually has a lot more detail in terms of the types of terrain. We've got forests, we've got the Alps up here, and this map kind of abstracts some of that stuff. We've just got kind of a general rough uh, elevated terrain here. Um, but in but in general, I mean, these games are about the same thing, and I think it's cool to see the scale difference between the two. When you set up Straff Expedition side by side, it's pretty epic looking. Um, but, you know, they, the games contain the same units in the, in the same uh, area of Italy, which, by the way, is... Uh, I, how do I describe this? Um, this area of Italy is to the west um, of... Or, excuse me, to the south of Trento, to the northeast of Verona, and to the west of Treviso. So, talking about northeast Italy. Anyways, just wanted to show you that. I think it's pretty cool. Um, let's talk about Burning Mountains 1916, and maybe one day we'll get to this game, which uh, I think would be a, a very interesting game to play, and I've talked a little bit about the system in my haul video if you want to go check that out. I'll, uh, I'll just zoom in here real quick and just show you some of the details on this map um, compared to the other one, but you can see here's, you know, from Arciero coming up here. You can see the different terrain types, and over here, obviously, a little more, a little more abstracted. Cool. So let's talk about uh, Burning Mountains 1916. Why was I interested in playing this? Um, especially given it was in a system I just played uh, that I was kind of lukewarm on. Well, one, I already knew the rules uh, for the most part. Two, um, it was about a topic that I'm really interested in. Um, and three, uh, it would seem to be pretty manageable with this map size. Again, this is a half size map, so uh, not too many counters either. Um, although you can see back up here how many reinforcements the Italians are going to get. Um, but there are some interesting things about this that I think um, are, are sort of little twists on Mike Resch's system that are unique to this particular part of the world and the campaign, and that I think are actually going to um, improve some of the issues that I had with Battle for Galicia 1914. Let me show you some of those. So first of all, as you can see, we've got fortress units. Um, but the other big thing that jumps out at me is we've got attack, defense, and movement points, and we've also got different unit types uh, so, for example, we've got a mountain regiment here. We've also got some mountain troops for the Austro-Hungarians as well. And you can see that their combat and defense values are uh, better than some of the units they're facing off against this brigade here, for example. Um, and that was one of the things that I complained about in Battle for Galicia, that all the units felt cookie cutter. Well, in this game, um, they're a little more varied, which I find interesting. There's also special rules around elevation in this game. Obviously, being fought in the Alps and this just terrible, difficult terrain, um, there are going to be some special rules. So when you're attacking up an elevation, step, uh, you're going to lose, uh, your attack strength is going to be decreased. Artillery, when they are higher than, uh, higher than the units around them, are also going to be more potent. Speaking of artillery, you can see that we still have the integrated um, artillery strength here for the units like we did in Battle for Galicia. However, um, for the most part, it's really only one. Some units might have two. And then um, Andrea Brusati has also... Uh, separated out artillery as their own units, which I actually like. I think that's one of the things that it was sort of abstracted in Battle for Galicia that I thought was, and also Serbian, Miss Serbian, and so forth, that I felt was a little, uh, was an abstraction that I, I didn't like. So we've got actual artillery units here, and they've got artillery strength that they can add to combats when they're stacked uh, with uh, infantry units. And we've also got um, some really big guns here, some assault artillery. Uh, those have an extended range, so they can actually bombard and provide their artillery support uh, two hexes away. So that's really interesting, and I think that uh, sort of dynamic is, you know, the positioning of your artillery and where you're using it is going to be interesting. It's not just you line units up and whatever artillery they have. You can reallocate artillery around the front um, into different positions, so that's cool. Um, we've kept sort of a core assignment system here, so you can see this is the Austro-Hungarian 8th Corps, this is the Austro-Hungarian 20th Corps, and then we've got the Austro-Hungarian 3rd Corps over here. Um, so the we've still got limits for attacking and defense, which is another thing I didn't like about Battle for Galicia. However, it's a little different here. Um, Defending units can't stack up as much as they could, and especially because the Italian army doesn't actually have any cores. They are only allowed to defend with up to two um, units, uh, independent units, and because all their units are independent, um, that's going to mean that there's always going to be able to be more attackers than there are defenders, uh, which I find is hopefully will make the game a little more, a little bit more dynamic. Um, so I'm excited about that. 
Um, and it, some of the stuff that's the same, obviously, we've got victory points um, for the uh, capture of cities and towns, the Austro and actually, and also of mountains as well, which historically saw lots of fighting where the Italians fell back to some of these really high elevation peaks and forced the Austro-Hungarians to, to charge up there and take it from them so they weren't getting shelled from high elevation. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, but in general, it looks like there's enough tweaks here to this game that uh, on this system that um, I think will make it for a little bit more dynamic experience despite the fact that we're fighting in the Alps um, or at least a more uh, tactical decision-making space, which is what I'm hoping for. We've also got forts. You can see those there. Those are defensive units um, that also provide, some of them provide artillery support. The Austro-Hungarians have them as well. Um, so just, you know, some slight little things that I think address some of those uh, complaints that I had. I also really like, by the way, before we continue talking, I also really, really like, I don't know if you can tell, but how the counters seem like they're hand-drawn. Like there's this sort of like grittiness to the line work here. Let me see if I can get closer. Um, but it looks like someone came in here with like a tiny little pencil or marker and like drew these on the counters, which is a great aesthetic, uh, a great aesthetic for these. So uh, hats off to the artist uh, who is uh, Ilya, mm, I should get his name correct. I should give him credit because the art is, is pretty good. Let's see if I can find the article. I know this is riveting content right now as I flip through a magazine. Uh, here we go. Graphics, Ilya Kudryashov. Uh, nice work, sir. Okay, let's talk about the game, um, you know, strategic view, view of what we're doing. I'm not going to go into the mechanics in this game because you can see that in the Battle for Galicia 1914 video. It's the same basic system. You're going to attack with units, you're going to roll a dice on a combat table, and you're going to roll a third die for combat losses. Um, based on some the result on the combat table and some other modifiers like artillery, um, you're going to then roll a combat effectiveness check against both sides in the combat. They will take some level of uh, combat effectiveness reductions. Uh, and uh, then you continue on. When you take enough, you flip it over, you take a step loss after you've taken three combat effectiveness reductions. In this game, unlike Battle for Galicia, once a unit is uh, lost a step, uh, it is gone. It cannot recover that. So I think that will also make the game a little more interesting and not fall into the sort of like attack, retreat, recover, attack, retreat, recover that uh, we saw there. From a victory point perspective, the Austro-Hungarians are going to need to get uh, more than 40 victory points, um, which is a tall task. Uh, they're going to get victory points for capturing these villages. They're going to get uh, five victory points for capturing these big cities. And they're going to get three victory points for capturing uh, these three key mountain locations here, here, and here, as you can see. So they've got their work cut out for them. They start the game with 10, and there's no victory point marker in the game, as far as I can tell. Um, so we're going to use some Austro-Hungarian colored cubes. We've got the uh, ones digit and the tens digit. And they're going to start uh, with uh, 10 victory points for what they currently control on the map. They're going to need to push forward and capture a, much, a lot of this territory. And as you can see, the big victory point point um areas that they have sort of within their grasp immediately are Asiago over here, grab some cheese while they're at it, um, Arciero here, which is going to be a tough run down this valley because the Italians have sort of good positions um, along the, the high elevation areas here, but the Austro-Hungarians definitely have the big artillery pieces. Um, and then we've got this very sparsely defended um, left flank of the Italians over here where there's just a couple of brigades, a mountain regiment holding back the entire 8th Corps. Now, historically, the Italian army was in a really bad state at this point, uh, and uh, this advance was extremely quick uh, in the initial phases of the campaign. The Austro-Hungarians can march down here. They can grab some of these villages. There's a mountain here. You know, that's uh, six points available to them, seven points if you count here, uh, available to them right here. But they do have to be worried because... There are a lot more Italian reinforcements than there are Austro-Hungarian reinforcements. And every turn, the Italians are going to be beefing up their strength as the Italian high command was calling in units from all over the um, Italians, uh, including the Isonzo Front um, and elsewhere in Italy. So uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a challenge, but uh, you know they've got the initial manpower. There's also some special rules on turn one where the uh, Austro-Hungarians are going to get some advantages with their artillery, a surprise attack style thing we've seen, like you saw in Soissons. So I expect that the initial turns for the uh, Austro-Hungarians should be pretty effective. Now, the game does take place from... Um May 15th and ends on June 11th. So we're talking about almost a month here. Every turn is about two days and it's of course 14, uh, 14 turns in the game. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll get on with it. I think the, you know, from the Austro-Hungarian perspective, I'm trying to figure out which, which avenue of advance seems to be best. You know, the Italians have pretty tight defense over here, but a lot of these units with these orange circles can't actually move or do anything on the first turn. A majority of the artillery strength for the Austro-Hungarians here is in the center, and there's not very many Italian units, but the terrain is really bad. So 
it's gonna the the natural line of advance is gonna be sort of down this river canyon, um, and you know they might be opening themselves up to uh, some some uh, flanking by the Italians, especially as they get reinforcements and some of these units are able to march up the board. I definitely think this is gonna be sort of the most dynamic and maneuver uh, based section of the map, uh, and that the Austro-Hungarians are going to. Um, find early success and probably want to exploit that down this river. However, that is going to leave them open from counterattack because I do believe some of the Italian reinforcements are going to come on here at Ala, and that is going to be problematic if they come up this road and uh, surround them. So there's no easy answer here. I think, you know, where, what, how, what basket are we putting our eggs in as the Austro-Hungarians? I mean, part of me feels like if we can get outside and cut through here and, and get Asiago surrounded, then we can come down this wide open area, even though it is at a higher elevation, and kind of sweep down here and push into our Sierra. Historically, it was the other way. The Austro-Hungarians came this way and, and pushed through the center. So I might try that. I think that might be my strategy going into the game. We're going to push hard on the Austro-Hungarian left flank. We're going to try and do as much damage as we can to the Italian center and right um, and just take what we can get here. And uh, once we've pushed them back far, you know, once we sort of have pushed them back, make a play for Asiago, make a play for Arciero, um, get those victory points in hand, uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll have done a good enough job before the steam starts to run out. For the Italians, obviously, I'm going to be picking the best defensive terrain I can find. A lot of these mountains are really good. These uh, these ridges, these alpine ridges here cannot be crossed, so we do have some funneling happening into the map. Um, and, uh, you know, that decision will probably be pretty tactical based on the success of the Austro-Hungarians as we go. Um, you can see that turn four is going to be a big one for both sides. That's going to be the majority of forces uh, for the Austro-Hungarians coming in. So uh, we want to get as far as we can as the Austro-Hungarians by that point uh, so that we can, you know, maintain the momentum as we go. I think breaking these mountain hexes is going to be pretty tough. It seems like there's some good defensive benefits there. And uh, otherwise... Um, that is, that is what the game looks like, uh, and I'm excited to play this. The Italian front is one that is very fascinating to me in World War I, um, and it will be the subject of a future Comics for Wargamers episode as well, um, which is where I developed the interest in that particular front. So, won't you join me as we play some Burning Mountains 1916? Well, I just completed the initial uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, attacks here on the first turn, basically uh, the surprise attacks um, to begin the offensive, and uh, not as effective as, say, something like Soissons, but uh, certainly did a lot of damage. The, uh, a bunch of Italian brigades here along the front uh, were reduced, um, so that is going to be a permanent status for them for the rest of the game. Actually, this one here is uh, very close to breaking. He's taken another combat effectiveness because he had to retreat across this uh, minor river here uh, into these uh, mount uh, low mountains, or I guess regular mountains, um, the Austro-Hungarians uh, took pretty minimal losses. Uh, their mountain brigades uh, led the assault, which uh, gave them, and one of the attacks gave them a, a bit of an advantage. Um, but uh, in general, pretty good. Um, the problem was is that uh, across the rest of the uh, the front, um, the Austro-Hungarians were not well positioned to take advantage of their first turn sort of surprise. The twenty. Uh, 20th... Uh, 20th Corps um, was attacking in the mountains, which means you can only get two steps uh, attacking into there, so they couldn't bring all of this force to bear necessarily. They did force this Ancona Brigade uh, back down south, but there are really no other attacks. They've got artillery here. Artillery can't attack on its own. Really, uh, just artillery here. A fort, an infantry that's not really in position because of this like blocking uh, Alpine Ridge. Uh, and then over here, we didn't want to attack because these units uh, aren't active yet, and if we attacked them, they would have become active. So that would have allowed the Italians to counterattack on um, on their turn that's about to happen right now. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, mixed mixed results. I may be changing my strategy a little bit just based on the fact that uh, there's a, a majority of the Austro-Hungarian force here is positioned to actually, uh, like, move and, and sort of push that, uh, push that assault forward. So uh, my best laid plans may be altering on the fly. Uh, but that's what a good commander does, right? Um, this uh, unit here, this regiment, by the way, I believe is an Italian bicycle regiment, um, is what the rules say. So uh, that, that's pretty interesting. I'm wondering if the designer has any sort of uh, special um, connection to this, the history of this regiment. They're the only one in the game that's like that. They have a different color symbol, as you can see. Anywho, uh, we're about to take the Italian turn, and they are likely going to... Um, move up uh, a bunch of these uh, units that they've got sort of sitting down uh, on their way to, to the Alps. Sorry about the focus. Uh, they're going to they're gonna bring these up and try and uh, plug, plug this hole um, as it were. 
One other thing that I want to mention that I actually discovered um, as I took this first turn is that uh, a small but significant change to the game system uh, that is going to speed up play quite a bit and I think is actually fairly genius. So the game has you using uh, 3d6, two, one color for the combat table, and then this for the um, combat effectiveness reductions. So in Serbian Misturbian and Battle for Galicia, you need to roll this die for each side in the combat and add modifiers to each roll. Became very tedious by the end of playing Battle for Galicia. In this game, the design has basically said you roll all three you get your combat result that's a good roll right there you get your combat result and then this die applies to both sides in the combat now different sides will have different modifiers to this so you still have to calculate it twice but you don't have to roll it twice and that my friends is how you streamline game design and um lower the player friction you don't have to this is going to save me probably hundreds of rolls over the course of this game because i'm not going to have to roll it for both sides i roll it once with the rest of the combat dice i get to playing i get to the effects of the combat and we move boom 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 through the turns i love it i love it i may actually port this rule over to uh, some of mike resh's other designs i think it's great we are three turns into the game. We just finished the Italian um, third turn, which is the 19th and 20th of May. Uh, you can see the Austro-Hungarian advance is uh, pushing pretty hard here down the left side of the map, in particular over here on this road, which is a, a really dangerous defensive lane, but the Italians absolutely do need to protect it. So they're trying to block their way in sort of these foothills here. Um, from these large Austro-Hungarian stacks. The Italians actually did get a chance to counterattack here. This uh, Austro-Hungarian mountain uh, brigade found itself um, a little further ahead uh, than of the rest of its sort of um, cooperating forces and uh, put them in kind of a bad position. They were coming down this road uh, in these low hills and suddenly this uh, Italian uh, mountain brigade and this reduced infantry brigade here found themselves surrounding it, uh, getting in a flank attack. Unfortunately, the roll did not go as well as the Italians would have hoped and it was kind of an even exchange, um, which I guess for the Italians they'll take given the amount of manpower they're going to have by the end of this game. Uh, but in general, the Austro-Hungarians, I think, maybe a little dissatisfied with the speed of their advance. They would have hoped to have broken through. They made an attack here last turn, and it was nothing happened. Um, what's interesting about this scale is that it changes the combat dynamic. So in Battle for Galicia, you mostly had division-sized units, which in meant that almost every combat there was at least one or two combat effectiveness reductions. Here we're talking about brigades. Um, and because of the terrain limitations on the number of steps that can attack uh, and the number of units compared to the distance of the front, we're talking about uh, the opportunity for a lot of combats, especially if you roll low on the uh, combat effectiveness roll, to not really result in anything. Um, so that's what happened here. The Austro-Hungarians, you know, the, this Italian regiment held off this uh, mountain brigade uh, quite nicely. And in general, we had a couple of more of those as well. We had a couple of those up here where the Austro-Hungarians, despite the artillery superiority, just couldn't uh, do, have any effect on these Italian defenders, and they really want to break through here to get to Asiago if they can. Most of the Italian reinforcements uh, have come up the road to bolster this central area, and you can see that the Italian defense starting to come together, starting to come together. Now, they're starting to form up. They're starting to get organized. Uh, we have the opportunity to uh, retreat the um, Sicilia Brigade out of danger, recover uh, at effectiveness level, while the uh, Mantova Brigade moved up the road to stop this um, attack here. And one of the other interesting wrinkles here is that because artillery are, are different, uh, separate standalone units, it actually makes their use uh, a, a lot more tactical and a lot more strategic as well. When they move, they get flipped over to this movement side. Here, I'll, I'll move this in so you can see it. Uh, when they move, they get flipped over to this movement side. So here they're ready to fire. They can shoot, and this is a particularly good artillery unit. Uh, but when they move, they've got to go to this movement side, which means they cannot fire at all. And so uh, they their movement speed is pretty slow. And so as the, as the Austrian Hungarian brigades get forward, the artillery struggle to keep up and they don't have the range um, with which to support some of these attacks, which is uh, actually fascinating. And that's what actually happened over here. The Austro-Hungarians were not able to uh, mount an attack despite huge numerical superiority here with these two uh, mountain brigades. Um, this artillery unit had to move down to get into position. It was not in range to support them, and that prevented an attack here. So the Italians very happy to delay while the Austro-Hungarians get their shit together um, and figure out what they're going to do on their next turn. So we are entering turn four. It's the Austro-Hungarian go, and uh, we'll see. They've, they've got a lot of work to do before the Italian nu uh, numerical advantage starts to really pick up. So they really need to be down here. They need to be down here picking up these uh, these small towns uh, and they need to be doing that very quickly. Uh, this is kind of a waste of time, it turns out. And so I think I'm going to break off some of those units and, and come and try and drive the spear through here. Maybe grab this mountain hex if I can, make a push for it at least. 
Uh, but there you go, very much enjoying this. Some of the little tweaks and subtle changes make this uh, a very much, much more playable game in this system. Reaching the end of May here, we're about to head into uh, June, and it's been two weeks for the Austro-Hungarian invasion here, uh, furious fighting in the Alps. The Austro-Hungarians have managed to shove the Italians uh, back here, down here towards uh, Mount Pasubio. Uh, this turn, they finally were able to capture... Uh... Ooh, that is Angibeni, the village there, so that's a point. But they're still only at 13 points. The progress has been pretty slow for the Austro-Hungarians. They're not where they need to be right now. The Italians just doing their best to clog everything up. And actually, you know, the terrain in this game does make a huge difference. Especially as you can see here, you can see these, these alpine ridges that funnel essentially one hex of uh, access to the defender and the Italians are just piling up uh, units in this little channel down this road to stop the Austro-Hungarians from grabbing these villages. Uh, the Austro-Hungarians have been shoving as hard as they can trying to put the point of attack on these units. Um, they had some artillery in position last time. They're not going to have it this time, at least not here. Um, they may be able to attack the, they may be able to move down here and attack, uh, this mountain, these high mountains, these high Alp mountains. This is what, uh, 6,600 feet, um, here. And that's obviously worth three points. So they're probably going to want to, um, you know, they got to pick here essentially because they don't, they don't, there's no access here and they may not have the strength here. Further up the line, the, uh, the 20th Corps has been uh, shoving against the Italians in this uh, mountainous region, and it's been slow going, although they did manage to defeat the fort uh, in this hex this turn um, and uh, did do some damage to some of these units, forced them to retreat pretty far. So uh, they, these are some fresh units that came in as reinforcements. Um, what they're trying to do is break through and, and grab Arciero. If they can grab Arciero, this is a bit of a linchpin on this map. If they can grab Arciero, they've got access to a lot of different stuff. If they manage to get down here, this part of the front's going to have to fall back unless they be surrounded and pocketed. You got more points down here. Um, that's, I mean, it's probably as far as the Austro-Hungarians can make it. Uh, I don't see them being able to push too far beyond that, just where we are in the game, how many Italian reinforcements are coming, and just the, the punching power of the Austro-Hungarian army of what's left. It just uh, In this sector in particular, they lost an artillery unit that uh, got caught out after an attack went horribly wrong. The Italians picked that off. And it's just surrendered. It was a good piece of artillery. There's three artillery strengths. So uh, that has been tough for them. These, this artillery up here is going to have to move down this turn. So they'll be out of action. These units made a little uh, little fishing expedition uh, to try and see if they could nab Asiago. The Italians got wise to that. You can't see it here, but there's an alpine ridge that runs all the way down this uh, hex, these hex sides. So uh, there was no danger of being um, surrounded potentially, but uh, the defense was just too strong. And, you know, if they had moved further, they would have been out of, would have been low supply, which would have affected their ratings. So that was a bad idea. So they've turned around, they've wasted some time, and they're going to come back and try and uh, push down this road. This is a really strategically positioned fortress here with artillery and a unit. Uh, so it's not going to be easy for the Austro-Hungarians. They did get some reinforcements last turn who might be able to come up this way and cut through here. Again, more points available, but... Uh, it's been it's been tough. It's been tough. The Italians have been playing good defense. They've been positioning well. They've been funneling attacks where they've been weak. And, uh, you know, it's just been hard to get manpower, as you would expect in this type of terrain on this type of front. Over here, um, the Austro-Hungarians did actually do uh, a quite nice job this turn and sort of cleared an opening here that they're going to try and exploit on this turn coming up. This Italian unit's actually out of supply. It got kind of surrounded. Uh, and that is a mountain infantry unit who is now not in the mountains anymore because he's got to get out of there. So uh, they might they might run an attack there, see if they can pick him off. Of course, that will be victory points. Here's what the Italians have lost so far. Here's the fortress, an artillery unit. Um, these don't count for anything. I don't know if the fortresses do either. Uh, and then there's the bicycle regiment and the Roma brigade are the only things that the Austro-Hungarians have managed to, uh, to destroy. Uh, the Italians sort of doing a good job at uh, falling back, recovering, getting new units up to the front, really just doing their best to slow the AH down. So we'll see what's in store here. We've got, uh, what is that, four, five more turns, what, six more turns left. Um, so I'll check in before the end of the game. But uh, Austro-Hungarians, I would rather be the Italians at this point than the Austro-Hungarians. But uh, who knows what can happen. Coming down to the end here, and we've got two turns left, it looks like. Yeah, two turns. Uh, not a ton happening. I, I feel like the Austro-Hungarians have been just like right on the precipice in terms of being able to push through. They almost... Uh, they almost took our Sierra. They were they were tantalizingly close. They almost took Mount Pasubio, which is under this unit here. Uh, so tantalizingly close, and then some re Italian reinforcements managed to uh, put the herd on a bunch of these uh, mountain divisions. Really, the only place that the Austro-Hungarians have made uh, great, real success 
full progress has been down here. They did manage to capture Allah. They managed to defeat a bunch of the divisions that were protecting this approach, and now they don't really have anywhere else to go. They can't come down this way. That'll put them out of supply. Uh, you know, they could turn around and try and go back, but with the time we have left in the game, probably unlikely that they're going to have an effect. Uh, but as you can see, Italian losses are starting to mount, uh, really, and the Austro-Hungarians haven't lost anyone yet, but uh, at the end of the game, reduced units are going to count for victory points on both sides. So I'm not quite sure what that situation looks like right here. The Austro-Hungarians probably have an advantage there. I just don't think they have enough of uh, the big victory point spaces to make it to where they need to be to win. Uh, and the offensive power, uh, while the Austro-Hungarians do have sort of an offensive power to punch pretty late into this game, I mean, there have still been situations here in the last turn or so where the Austro-Hungarians have been managing to crawl forward. Um, it does feel like it has, uh, at this point, sort of petered out all across the line. The Italians committed uh, lots of strength points up here around this fort and around this sort of approach here. They, uh, they have a lot of forces piling up in these mountains, and the Austro-Hungarians have just kind of run out of steam they don't really, you know, there was, there've been battles back and forth here in this mountain region by uh, these high elevation, uh, but fort sort of neighborhood. And uh, they did for a turn manage to put the unit that was in here out of supply, but uh, didn't have any effect. The Italians were able to counter punch, push the uh, Austro-Hungarians out. They did actually a lot of losses to this division here. And uh, in general, this has become fairly static over here. A lot of these, uh, this area as well, fairly static. There's really only one approach down this road. There's uh, just so much bad terrain in here that funnels the attacks. The Italians have clogged it up pretty nicely. Reinforcements have moved in here and really just, you know, made the Austro-Hungarians throw their, bang their head against the wall, even with this, all this artillery. I mean, they have more artillery at this point than they know what to do with. And they're just not able to drive the stake through the heart of this defense. You can see these alpine ridges here. Again, you know, this, it looks like there's a breakthrough here. It looks like there's a gap in the front. But these alpine ridges um, are really only allowing one unit, one division, two divisions at most come through here. And the Italians have rotated out defenders uh, that were pretty exhausted, moved in some new ones. And now the Austro-Hungarians basically have to take sort of a defensive posture to hold those ground, that ground. I would say really the only opportunity left would be if they could take Mount Pasubio. If they can do that, that's three points. They can maybe knock out a couple of other units, um, get points for that. But in general, we're pretty much winding down here uh, from uh, for this game. And that's about as far as the Austro-Hungarians have made it. I think I'm probably behind schedule historically uh, by a fair margin. Um, and, and I've learned some things about uh, this game in particular, playing it uh, about how to play the Austro-Hungarians better. You need to be super aggressive very early, I think. Um, and you really need to uh, keep driving uh, sort of linchpin locations um, until you can, uh, you know, sort of force the Italians to capitulate somewhere. Even that said, it is really hard to sort of make major breakthroughs and take huge ground. But like, you know, I, I, I think I could have probably taken our Sierra here if I had been a little more focused at the beginning and if I had not wasted so much time kind of messing around up here. Um, because I think ultimately this is a bit out of reach. The, the Austro-Hungarian position up here is kind of awkward. It, it does not get a good start. The Italians have a lot of strength. There's a lot of um, strong defensive uh, positions for you know with very few Italian units, and so I think it's probably more trouble than it's worth to try and do anything here. I think your best bet as the Austro-Hungarians is to probably hold this flank and just drive everyone you can either down this road here or really try and push uh, this way to get into this valley. Uh, because there's a you know there's a lot of points down here, so uh, pretty interesting. Looking forward to a replay of this at some point. Uh, but uh, here we are. Uh, we're going to the final two turns. I will come back and show you where we end up there, and uh, my final thoughts on the game. We have reached the end. We've reached the end of the game. We've reached the end of this operation, this offensive from the Austro-Hungarian Empire against Italy here in Burning Mountains 1916. And um, what is the final outcome? Well, I will get to that. I think it's actually a pretty interesting final outcome, but I do want to recap what happened on the final couple of turns. The uh, These two infantry brigades from the 20th Corps, who are pretty powerful, managed to drive down this road, push back sort of the, the uh, tenuous Italian defense, we'll call it. They were stretched and managed to take the village of Pusina. So that was a point there at the end. And on the final turn, the Austro-Hungarians actually... Uh, changed their fortunes, and this is what actually uh, gave the outcome to the game that we have, which, like I said, I will get to, to keep you in suspense, but all of these mountain brigades were all reduced, all suffering at reduced strength, managed to push the Italians off the mountain. They captured Mount Pesubio at 22, over 2,200 meters, uh, and that was three points for the Austro-Hungarians. They managed to do it without losing one of these units, which is pretty impressive, um, and I believe they uh, they 
they almost eliminated the Italian defenders. I don't think they quite eliminated any of them, which would have been more points, but that did give them three. And that was by far a big, a big points target, a big strategic objective for the Austro-Hungarians. And functionally what that has done here um, has pretty much opened the way into this valley. Uh, the Italians are scattered, as you can see. They've got attackers coming down all sides. This unit here is gonna have to, if there was another turn, would have to pull back. They, these guys don't have enough strength to attack, but uh, certainly once these uh, mountain brigades are able to uh, come down from the hills and surround this road, that would put this guy out of supply, potentially this guy out of supply, and um, so it's just not a tenable position. They would have had to fall back here to the foothills in the valley. That would have opened the way for the Austro-Hungarians. Here, uh, you know, these are still full strength. They've lost no combat effectiveness. They arrived pretty late uh, in the um, in the campaign. Not arrived uh, in the game, but they were recovering for a couple of turns to get back to full strength. I was trying to play pretty conservatively with Austro-Hungarian Austro losses since it did deduct points from them at the end of the game. Uh, but these Italian defenders are all kind of spent, and so these guys could have had their way with this stack. They probably would have had their way with this stack. This heavy artillery here would have been supporting them from the mountains. So, um, you know, really this whole, uh, this whole approach coming down here towards um, Recoaro and uh, Schio, Schio. Um, this all would have been in danger. Um, the, our, the Italians would have had to, to sort of stand back here. Um, up here, the, the Italians did counterpunch uh, where they had the majority of their strength. They managed to destroy a Italian, or excuse me, an Austro-Hungarian uh, mountain core. Uh, that put these guys in a really bad way. There's an Alpine ridge on this side of them you can't see, so they're going to be completely out of supply next turn. Uh, they would have had to do some sort of attack to break out, maybe get some assistance here. But as you can see, the Austro-Hungarians pretty much crumbling on this side. And, you know, the game goes any longer. These Italians are going to be able to push through and kind of encircle uh, the Austro-Hungarian flank, which is not what they want. Um, and obviously, with no reinforcements coming, not a lot they could do. These guys, like I said, they would have taken some time to come down here and maybe could have supported this attack on the valley. So a little bit of a snake eating its own tail. Um, but we have finished the game, and I did calculate the victory points, and, you know, I was I was pessimistic about the Austro-Hungarians, uh, their position. I thought, man, this is just going to be impossible. There's no way they can uh, they can get the points that they need. They needed to win. They needed 41. Um, and the ultimate points tally uh, up here, if you were looking at that, is 35 points for the Austro-Hungarians, which is actually, according to the victory point schedule, on the very lowest end of draw that you can possibly get. Um, 35 to 40 points is a draw. So uh, what did we learn from this? Well, uh, it was a very close game, and if it wasn't for this final turn uh, attack on Mount Pesubio, the Austro-Hungarians would have lost. Um, it's a competitive game, unlike, say, uh, Battle for Galicia 1914, where it's you know it came down to the wire here. It came down to the final turn. Um, and from a historical perspective, uh, the Italians... Well, first of all, from a historical perspective, the result of draw is the most World War One thing you could possibly hope for in a game about World War One. am I right? Um, but the Italians uh, did put up a really stout defense. I think they played it really well. They were just kind of throwing units into the front, throwing as soon as they could arrive on the map, they were marching as fast as they could, throwing them in front of the Austro-Hungarians, which is really pretty much what the Italian defensive strategy was for this uh, particular operation in real life. Um, and they managed to put enough Italians between the Austro-Hungarians and what they wanted to accomplish and slowed them down just enough that that um, no one ended up winning this. The Italians fought them to a standstill. I think they have certainly a tactical advantage up here. They probably would need to reorganize uh, down here if they wanted to stand a chance of holding this. Uh, and the Austro-Hungarians, for their part, um, they got as far, I think, as you can reasonably expect. Um, you know, maybe not achieving all of their strategic goals, but certainly giving the Italians a good run. And, um, you know, I, you, some might think, oh, you played that whole game as a, in, in, to a draw, and, like, that's got to be really unsatisfying. Actually, no, I actually think this is a really satisfying game. And that's a really good segue to my final thoughts as I give you a look at the dead pile here. On the final couple of turns, the Austro-Hungarians really put the hurt on uh, the Italians, as you can see. Um, eliminating seven total divisions in the game, um, a mountain regiment, this bicycle regiment, and this uh, Bersaglieri regiment. Some fortresses, some artillery units. Um, this is a great game. This is a, a great game. This is probably, of all the stuff World War One that I have played this month, um, this is my favorite game that I've played. This is my favorite World War One game I have played in the last four weeks. Um, this reminds me of um, When Eagles Fight, if you've watched that video. It's got the same kind of like very like just razor's edge, you know, balance of like trying to take ground and like feeling like you're just close enough. And if you just stretch hard enough, you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to accomplish what you're setting out to accomplish. Um, and so in that way, I think that's one of the highest compliments I can pay it is that um, it feels really balanced. There's meaningful decisions. Um, it doesn't devolve into a stalemate where nothing gets accomplished. You know, there's movement and attack 
uh, throughout the entire game. Um, and like I said it, uh, in sort of the last segment, the Austro-Hungarians can penetrate pretty deeply um, well into the game. I mean, well after the reinforcements start showing up, if you've managed your forces well, the Austro-Hungarians still have a lot of punching power and their artillery is extremely deadly, especially if once you get down into some of these like tight funnels, the artillery can like just throw every turn uh, in defense and attack. The, uh, the Italians, on the other hand, you know, they're just trying to put up a wall. They're trying to hold. They're trying to use the terrain to their advantage. They're trying to stay out of the way of the... Um, not give the Austro-Hungarian Mountain Corps, um, you know, not give the Austro-Hungarian Mountain Corps an ability to use that plus one when they're fighting in mountains against non-mountain units. Um, and they have the overwhelming manpower advantage, but uh, their units aren't as strong, and they've got to be clever, and they've got to play the positional uh, positional terrain of the map, um, because that's super important. Um, they can't just expect to have sort of a wide front defense. You know, they can funnel the Austro-Hungarian attacks down these narrow approaches and really slow it down. So I think there's really meaningful decisions for both players to make in this game, um, and that have that pay dividends over the course uh, of the camp, of, of the actual game itself. You know, decisions I made in turn five were impacting me, and decisions in turn eight, um, and especially the artillery. Um, the addition of units, uh, being, artillery being their own distinct units uh, that can either fire or move is a huge addition to this system that I think is, uh, like if, if anyone else is going to design a game in this system, I think you have to have that. I, I think it just makes the decision space so much more interesting. I think it makes um, sort of the planning that goes into how you move these, these units in um, really important because you may have the strength to launch an attack, but without the artillery support, it's not going to have much effect on the defender. Um, you know, it's just it's just extremely tight design. Uh, it's it's fun to play. It's interesting. Um, it's agonizing sometimes, not in the bad way, but like, oh, these decisions that I'm making. Do I move the artillery now? Do I move them closer so that they can continue firing on the next turn, or do I take the advantage I have at this particular moment when I've got the unit strength, even though knowing that when I take ground, they're not going to have artillery support next turn. Um, just in general, the game, you know, I talked about the dice, about how you make, you know, to determine combat effectiveness reductions. It's just one role for the entire combat. You know, the designer here, Andrea Brusati, has done an amazing job of de-abstracting some of the stuff that Mike Resch sort of abstracted in this system. And had I not played Battle for Galicia so recently, I probably would not have appreciated that as much. But I will definitely tell you right now, if you are looking for a World War I game on the Italian front, uh, this game is great. Uh, this is a great game. It's affordable because it comes with a Paper Wars magazine. It's a magazine game. Um, and, you know, I, I highly recommend this. Um, I think, you know, of all the games in this system I've played so far, which is Battle for Galicia, Serbian Misturbian, and this, Burning Mountains 1916, this is my favorite implementation of this system. And I hope I hope that uh, either the designer of this game or someone else out there um, wants to, you know, is able to use this system and see what else they can do with it um, and what else they can sort of evoke out of the historical situation because uh, it is very uh, interesting, um, very good. You know, I think there's maybe even further refinements to this system that will lead to sort of more, that can be applied to other fronts. I mean, I'd like to see this system applied to sort of the Middle East, right? The, uh, the Turks and the British, you know, why don't we get, what, how awesome would it be to get a, um, a game about sort of that conflict, you know, the Ottomans and, and the British in, in the Middle East? Um, why am I blanking on his name? The movie, there's a famous movie about it. Oh my goodness. It is, it's late. Lawrence of Arabia, that's what I'm thinking of. How awesome would this system be um, in sort of a Lawrence of Arabia setting, right? I think there's ways, you know, that you could make this system uh, in sort of that larger area scale and smaller unit scale, I think, um, be really fascinating as well. Um, so uh, that is, that. Is, those are my final thoughts on the game. Um, I, I think this is a, a fantastic package. I think it is a great game. One of my favorite World War I games. Um, you know, if I want to bust out a World War I game right now, um, it's either this or When Eagles Fight, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, in terms of a one map, you know, single evening game or even long afternoon game. Um, so yeah, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I certainly enjoyed this. It was nice to come to something that I had fun playing. Um, and is not too labor intensive or uh, confusing from a rules perspective. That's going to wrap up this World War One month. I hope you enjoyed that. I have plenty more World War One games to play, but we're going to sprinkle them into the upcoming channel content. Uh, what can you expect next? Well, uh, the first thing I want to show you, by the way, uh, while we're talking about this, is actually over the weekend I started playing a face-to-face -face game of Next War Vietnam. So you can see some of that here. I'm storing it in this room until uh, we can get a chance to pick up our our uh, our next game. Um, but next uh, next. 
I'm, I don't know what I'm going to play next. I know that my Order of Third Winter ship today, so you'll be seeing content on that probably as soon as it comes in. I definitely want to get one of the smaller scenarios and that to the table, revisit some OCS. I think that'll be really good. Um, and then I have some other ideas for games that are kind of off the wall. I've got a special project that I want to do over the course of two or three games um, to examine the history around those games uh, that I might do. And I'm studying great campaigns of the American Civil War from a rules perspective uh, because I am learning that because that looks pretty fascinating as well. I'm not the biggest Civil War fan, but uh, the, the game system looks pretty um, appealing and interesting there, and I love operational stuff. So I don't know. It'll be a surprise. Uh, coming up, I've got um, a, an episode of Comics for Wargamers. Uh, that's going to be next week probably or the week after. And I do want to do a video and show you the rest of my World War One game collection uh, because there are some games that I have on World War One that either I have not played yet or I cannot play solo um, by their very nature. I think Paths of Glory, CDG kind of thing. So I might do a little brief tour, World War One collection tour. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed uh, Burning Mountains 1916 and, um, and that little quick view of my cat. I will see you in the next one.